So we have a list of items, and we fold those and put them in the bag, and then the town takes those and delivers them to people who rent it who can't get out for various reasons. So that works out really well. We uh, have a lot of basic things like cereal, beans, big beans, macaroni, rice, pasta, pasta sauce, soup, vegetables, fruit, canned pasta, peanut butter, tuna, chicken, chili, uh, sliced beef, cookies, uh, some of these ready-to-eat meals, uh, paper towels, toilet paper, and loaf bread. So we also have extra things like grapefruit, and then we'll throw in some cookies and different things that we might have as well. For 48 or 72 hours, just in case they can move any virus on them. And then I'll come in and count them usually on an off day and pack them up and put them away. Okay, so this is our space. You can see it's fairly small, which is why we wouldn't have a lot of, of our volunteers back here working together because it would be hard to maintain the, uh, the distance. But you see we do a pretty good job of keeping a nice variety of things. We have a full shelf of cereal. We have a lot of beans. This shelf would be all of our pasta and our pasta products. You can see we have some empty space down here at the end. This part of the shelf would normally have a lot of mashed potatoes. Um, for whatever ever reason, we seem to be very low on that. The next shelf are all of our soups. You can see the beginning part of the shelves are pretty good. You get down to this area. Normally, this is where we would have a lot of broth. We would have chicken broth, beef broth, vegetable broth, uh, turkey broth, and we would have gravy and we would have ramen. So for whatever reason, that section of the shelf seems to be pretty empty. Uh, the next section down are all of our canned vegetables, our canned fruit. Again, we're doing pretty well on that, although different types of fruit always tend to turn over quickly. Um, for example, we don't have much pineapple. We have a lot of peaches, but no pineapple, so that's always a good thing to get more of. The bottom shelf are all of our canned meats and pastas. So that's where you'll see things like the spaghetti, the ravioli, the beefaroni. Uh, we have hash and corned beef. We have beef stew, tuna, chicken. Um, that's a good thing because our, a lot of our clients are single men who live in the hotel or small apartments where they don't have any cooking facilities. So to open up a can of beef stew becomes a good meal for them. On this side, again, we have a few spaces here, but not too bad. Um, this is kind of our baking area, so we have a lot of cake mixes. Um, this morning, we just received a wonderful donation of flour, so that helped fill that in. Um, and as far as sugar, same thing with that. All right, here. Uh, this next shelf would be our peanut butter, our jelly, mayonnaise, coffee. Uh, we have salad dressing and mustard and ketchup, and cookies and crackers and juice. It looks like things are pretty full. But for example, if we have a client who we give 50 items to, and let's say we have 10 clients, all of a sudden that's 500 items that have come out of the food pantry. Um, it's not normally quite that large a family or that number of, of items. But the idea is, the point is there's a lot of items that you know, if a lot of people ask for them, all of a sudden we are, um, we, we get pretty low pretty quickly. Um, I think we're doing very well at this point. We, have, again, have had terrific support from groups and organizations, and the continual list that we, we give you of what items we might be low on, um, that has helped. For example, like, we don't have a lot of salad dressing right now. And of course, we always give our clients a couple bottles of salad dressing, so that would be something that would be good to have on the list at this point. Uh, we, we were fortunate, we got a terrific donation in the fall of Girl Scout cookies because obviously every year there's a new Girl Scout cookie drive. So the old cookies tend to have a shorter shelf life because obviously they wanted to promote the, the fresher ones. So we've been able to uh, give clients a lot of cookies. We've got thin mints and peanut butter uh, patties right now to be able to give out. So that has been a wonderful treat for the clients. A number of years ago, the Rhode Island Food Bank had a grant that came through the Champlin Foundation. And food pantries like us were able to apply for that grant, and that's how we were able to get a lot of the items for the food cupboard, such as these freezers and cooler. It also enabled us to purchase the uh, metal shelving that you saw in the pantry itself. 
we were able to buy these carts, anything for the, uh, you know, kind of the capital improvements for the food cover. So you'll see in these freezers, we have a lot of meat. Most of this has been purchased at the Rhode Island Food Bank. So a client can have uh, fish, there's fish sticks, there's ground turkey, we have uh, snapper fillets, we have pork loin roast, we have some hot dogs, and we have two freezers. So the second one, I feel like Vanna White here, <laughs> showing you what's in here. We have some pulled pork, some cod, ground beef. Uh, we have a little bit of olive garden soup left, and we have some whole chickens. We've also been very lucky that the Stop and Shop has been saving bread for us every week. So our volunteer goes over and picks up a couple boxes of bread, and so we can offer those for clients too, which is wonderful. So we always have a lot of meat in there. This is the cooler, and in the cooler we have sliced cheese. We have cheese that we got from the Rhode Island Food Bank. It's a two-pound bag of shredded cheddar cheese. We have margarine as well as butter, and we have eggs. This morning we just received a wonderful donation from a, a couple who used to do a lot of volunteering with us, and they brought over some fresh hams. So that will be a client choice again today for whatever meat the person would like. They can have the, uh, the ham as well as any of the other choices too. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. 
and he vanished from their sight. Good morning. My name is Bill Trench. I'm the lead pastor. It's great to be with you in worship this morning. Although I wish we were really physically present with one another. I'm here this morning with Pastor Carol Reale, and you just met Pastor Carol reading the scripture. Uh, Beth Yurger, one of our uh, ministers of music. Uh, Al Meyer, who's our tech guy. And you just heard uh, Mona Stevens, uh, our other minister of music, um, playing the prelude. There are a couple of announcements that I would like to share with you this morning. Uh, first, I want to mention the ongoing ministries for um, Matthewson Street Church and for uh, the uh, ecumenical, excuse me, interfaith uh, food cupboard. And there are places out front of the church where you can uh, drop stuff off for both of those. I also want to mention that uh, tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, we'll start a, a new study group. We're doing Marcus Borg's uh, book, Speaking Christian, which is a very interesting um, take on how Christians talk to one another and the, um, the way that how we talk uh, influences our faith and helps us better understand our faith and the ways in which we need to reclaim um, an authentic language about that. The other thing I want to mention is that we are going to have communion this morning. We're in inviting you to share uh, in communion where you are at home. Now, if you attend um, here regularly, you know that uh, communion for us is often early in the service before the, um, before the children's moment and uh, before the kids leave for Sunday school. Well, in this case, uh, we're going to move communion to after the sermon because the sermon is really about uh, communion. So I'm mentioning that because I know, I've been told, that uh, sometimes the kids vanish during the sermon. I can't understand that. I don't know why they would do that. I'm deeply disappointed and offended. I'm looking at you, Riley. You need to stay right where you are. All right. Um, so, uh, so I'm telling uh, parents that you may want to go and round up the kids uh, for the communion. And as you prepare for that, any kind of um, juice um, will be appropriate. Wine, uh, if, if that uh, works for you. Uh, whatever bread is uh, best, and you may want to get those elements and uh, be ready to go at the end. The journeys that have brought us together are as varied and different as the human race. We celebrate the sacred worth of every journey because it's brought us to this time and this place, connected to God and to one another. We are seekers, doubters, and believers called to be followers of Jesus. Let's continue in a spirit of worship. Gather here in Jesus' name. concerns and celebrations most on our hearts and minds this morning. If you have uh, concerns that you'd like to share, you can write those into the chat uh, part of your um, uh, Facebook feed. Uh, we'll be able to get those for next week. You can also email them 
to egumc at aol dot com so that we will have them for for next week i do want to share that um shirley curtis passed away this week and we would ask your prayers with her family and loved ones pastor carol will be leading a service for shirley obviously a private service very small service at the cemetery later this week so to give you a minute to collect your concerns and pray silently for another for one another beth will now give us a musical interlude thank you Eternal God, before whom the morning stars first sang together, remind us again that you are the soul of the universe, the ground of our being, the giver of every good gift. Remind us again that it is you who made us and not we ourselves. Our hearts are heavy with the numbers, the deaths, the sickness, the fear and anxiety and emptiness of our isolation. We pray especially for those who are alone. We pray for those who grieve over the loss of loved ones and the loss of businesses, and we pray especially for those who have lost hope. Remind us that this is not forever, that flowers are blooming and birds are singing and leaves are bursting forth on the trees. Remind us that you are still with us. We give you thanks for health care workers and clerks and cleaners and helpful neighbors. We offer up all of this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together with sisters and brothers all across the whole human family, saying, as he said, Our Father, Father who art Lord in heaven, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy our kingdom, kingdom come. come. Thy will, will be done. done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The scripture this morning is a reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 28 through 35. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead of them as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it's almost evening and the day is nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. As we hear what the Spirit says to the church, may, may our, our hearts, hearts be open. open. Hi guys, and parents, and friends, and anybody else who happens to be here this morning. Um, isn't it interesting that after we read the scripture we say, um, as we hear what the Spirit says to the church, may our hearts be open. Um, 
I want you to just think about that for a second. Uh, did you notice too, I was thinking, did you notice that we have, you know, a Bible here um, and, and how the pages are flipped up, you know, to form a heart. There's so many scriptures that, that talk about the heart and reveal something about the heart, our hearts to us. And today's one of those scriptures. The scripture, um, we, we picked up the scripture a little further down the road, but the disciples were on a long walk that day, two of the disciples. Um, and they walked, it seems like Pastor Bill would probably know more, but seven miles or so. So it took a long time. That was a long walk. Can you figure out, ask your parents, how far is your house from the church? My house, I think, is about two miles, maybe, three miles, something like that. That would be a long walk for me in the morning. So they had lots of time to talk, and the disciples were, were walking and talking, and then they were joined by a stranger, it says a, a, a strange man. And this man began to speak with them about many scripture passages, a whole bunch of scriptures that were centuries old written by prophets and stories told by prophets. And this man even talked about, um, well, what was himself, because this man was Jesus. But the disciples didn't recognize him. For some reason, as they were walking and talking with this man, they didn't recognize him. And he even talked about himself, about his life, about what, was, what had come to pass. And yet still, they didn't recognize him. But they did say that they had, well, Cleopas said, he had a strange feeling, as if his heart was burning in his chest while the scriptures were being revealed to him, while the scriptures were being opened to him. It's another idea of your heart doing something. Well, in our Sunday school at home today, I sent you pictures of different hearts. One was the heart that beats inside our body, right? That heart that keeps us alive. Right? That's an organ, and that, that's the way that works. But then there was another heart that I sent to you, and it was actually what you might receive on a special day, Valentine's Day. It was a picture of a heart as if it was a valentine and a symbol of, of what? A, a symbol of love, right? Valentine's symbol of love. And there was another picture, and this is kind of another way that I, I want you to think about a, a heart. You see that? That's a person with a heart inside and it says, the real me. When you have a heart for people, when you, when you feel love, it's, it's like the way you think and the way you feel and the way you act combined. That's, that's love, right? That's having a heart because love isn't just a feeling. Love is an action. It's an action word. Love is, is doing. And one of the scriptures will open up for us the way Jesus did to the disciples is love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. Remember that? And love your neighbor as yourself. Right? That's love in action and having a heart. Will you say a prayer with me this morning and continue on? Gracious God, help us to have a heart of love and to guide us in all of our actions with the loving heart and mind. In Jesus' name I pray these things. Amen. time I listen to uh, Beth play, I'm tempted to just wait and listen to her play. Now she always, so the way we work this is she plays until I start speaking, but sometimes I'm tempted to not start, start speaking. And as the sunset faded, I spoke to the faintest first starlight and I said, next time, next time we'll get it right. That is from uh, Bob Seeger's um, song, Roll Me Away. I'm sure that I encountered Roll Me Away many, many years ago, um, but 
I really became aware of it when I bought the, uh, the CD of uh, Bob Seger's greatest hits, Bob Seger and the Silver Bullet Band. What a great name. Um, and uh, so I, I, I bought the thing because I wanted old time rock and roll, which I thought was like my favorite song in the whole wide world. Uh, but then I got a CD and I decided that Roll Me Away maybe was my favorite song in the whole wide world. Um, it's wonderful the sense in which it's really a theological statement. I mean, that's, that's, kind of, that's kind of life, you know? As the sunset faded, I spoke to the faintest first starlight, and I love that, faintest first starlight, and I said, next time, next time we'll get it right. It's a song about um, regret, but it's also a song about hope. It's a song about second chances. It's a song about how there's always a new possibility. Well, if you read the bulletin, uh, and it's okay if you did, you know. But if you did, uh, then you, you already saw um, that I'm convinced the disciples were singing that song on the way to Emmaus. Now you say to yourself, how did they do it without a guitar and drums? And uh, I don't know. But it clearly was the right song for them to sing on that journey. So we're talking about sacred journey, both in that song and in our story of Emmaus. And, um, and every Sunday when I welcome you, I say life is a sacred journey. Um, our journeys are different, varied. Um, no two journeys are the same, but every single one is sacred. And part of our faith involves both affirming and discovering the sacredness of the journey. And that's what happens to the disciples as they are on the way to Emmaus. Now, this week, I received an email from David Quigley. And he said, Bill, I know you're going to talk about Emmaus on Sunday. And I really hope you're going to tie that to your trip to Israel. So, David, this is for you. And, Susan, if he's not with you, you need to go and get him and bring him to hear this. All right. So, um, the trip to Israel was one of those uh, life-changing events for me. Ironically, I did not want to go. Not only did I not want to go, I really didn't want to go. Um, and I never would have gone except for two things. Uh, one, um, Rabbi uh, Richard Plavin in um, Manchester called me up and said there was this trip and, and uh, it was sponsored by um, the Masorti Travel Agency, which, is a, um, which works with conservative and reform congregations. And the rabbis were expected to, to bring um, a pastor with them and very low cost, 10 days for $1,000, including the uh, air travel, which is just terrific. Now, parenthetically, I discovered later that Rabbi Plavin had invited basically every pastor in town before he got to me. But at the time that I took the call, I didn't realize that, and so I was deeply honored. That story is a lot funnier if it's in Manchester and people know who Rabbi Plavin is, but that's all right. He's retired now anyway. Um, so, so one was Rabbi Plavin called, and the other was as I was uh, going through my list of excuses and reasons why I uh, could not do that and could gracefully decline, Elaine, for those of you who don't know, that would be my wife, Elaine. Um, Elaine said, Bill, you have to go. I said, why do I have to go? She said, you're a minister. Every so often, Elaine reminds me of that. I tend to forget. Mm -hmm. And she says, you know, I want you to understand who you are, what you're doing, so forth. And, you know, and it's helpful. Um, so anyway, um, Elaine reminds me of a lot of things that I tend to forget, which is, which is you know, you, you need somebody to do that. Um, so she said, you need to go. And also, we asked you. And also, who gets a chance to go to Israel with a bunch of rabbis? What could be better? Well, I said to myself, staying home could be better. Staying home could be lots better. 
because it doesn't involve air travel and it doesn't involve all those days. And plus, I would have to give up a Sunday um, preaching, which I hate to do. And by the way, I don't have that many left, so more precious as time goes by. Anyway, so I, 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 I decided to go, and um, I didn't decide to go. I decided I couldn't refuse. So, um, so I went. And um, we landed in Tel Aviv after forever on the plane. And, um, and we landed in Tel Aviv. And Tel Aviv is like any place anywhere. It's not, there's, a, there's not a single thing special, at least about the airport, in Tel Aviv. It's just an airport. Uh, it could be absolutely um, anywhere. I, I think when we landed, they wanted to play like Javi Nagila or something to tell us like you're in Israel. This is supposed to be a big deal. We we're flying on LL. Um, very safe, by the way, LL. Um, so I was still really, really reluctant. And uh, my friend, my the person who later became a good friend, uh, Rabbi Melissa Crespi, was explaining everything to me about where we were and what it meant, why it was important, and so forth. And I kept thinking, could you please just be quiet, because I'm really tired, and I've been on an airplane for like 14 hours, and I couldn't sleep, and I'm miserable. But anyway, we got off the plane, and we headed toward um, Jerusalem. And on the way, we stopped in Emmaus, except um, our guide, Ezra, pronounced it a mouse. Anyway, so we stopped in a mouse, which now is a state park. There's not, there's not any other, there's not a place there, there's not a village there, uh, but there is a state park, an Israeli uh, park. So we stopped there, and uh, everybody was invited to get off the bus. And if you can believe it, I almost didn't get off the bus. I was... A resistant, shall we say. That's putting it kindly. I was resistant to the whole process. And, um, and I was annoyed that everybody else was so enthusiastic about it. That's just lots of bad things about me. But hey, that's life. So anyway, um, I almost didn't get off the bus. But Melissa encouraged me. And Ezra said... Our guy said, aren't you, you know, like, what's the matter with you? Get off the bus. You're one of the ministers. This is the thing for you. So I did get off the bus. All right. So then, as I got off the bus, when I put my foot on the ground, I was overwhelmed with emotion. I couldn't explain why or what was going on. Um, but it was an overwhelming feeling. And Ezra pulled out a New Testament and was, wanted somebody to read the story of the walk to Emmaus. And um, I was overcome. I was overcome. I knew that you know, I certainly could not do that. And Ezra's, Ezra's pointing out what we're seeing and um, points to a place where he says, this is the old Roman road. So this is the road that uh, the disciples would have walked on. Like right here, we're standing on it. We're standing on it. So I couldn't read, but um, uh, Frank, a, um, an Episcopal chaplain, um, he read it. And it was dusk, so it's getting dark, which of course is perfect for the story. That's what happened. It was getting dark, and they encouraged him to stay. So it's getting dark, and Frank begins to read, um, and he gets to the end, and he says, I'm sorry, I can't see what it says. And the words that were coming up right then were, were not our hearts burning within us as he spoke to us about the scriptures. And I thought, yep, uh, yes, they were. From that moment on, that trip was transformative for me. Every, um, 
at every meal two things would happen one of the pastors would say grace and and one of the rabbis would say a blessing now they said the blessing in Hebrew and so it it took more than a meal for me to understand that what they were saying was the same each time and eventually I realized what I'm listening to is the same each time so they would say the blessing Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Ho'olam Amotzi Lechem Unen Haaretz Blessed art thou Lord our God ruler of the universe who brings forth bread from the earth and then they would break the bread and give it to us all right so and and, and pass it around and so after this happened for the second or third time, I thought, okay, so are they are they doing this for the benefit of the of the ministers here? Is this and it turns out, no, no, it's the blessing over the bread. There's only one blessing over the bread, and you break the bread before the rest of the meal, and, and that's just what you do. And I thought, wow. Well, that explains something, doesn't it? You know, and, I, and 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 to make sure, I turned to the rabbi next to me and said, "How old is that prayer?" He said, "I don't know, a couple thousand years, at least." Oh, and then of course, I realized that in all the scriptures, uh, it says that Jesus um, blessed the bread and broke it, and it never says what the blessing is. And of course, the reason it never says what the blessing is, is because there was only one blessing. There wasn't, there wasn't anything else that he would have said, and everybody knew exactly what he said, and all the people in the early church knew exactly what he said, and I assume they said the same blessing at that time. The blessing uh, and the breaking of the, of, of the bread is a fundamental act of faith. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Now, the people in Jesus' time um, and before were not ignorant of what happens. They know that you plant seeds and you, 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 you tend the field and the grain grows and then eventually you harvest it and then you grind it and then you put it into um, a, a loaf and you bake it. And that's how bread comes. It doesn't spring up out of the earth. Blessed art thou who brought forth, brings forth bread from the earth. No, no, God doesn't bring forth bread from the earth in that sense. But in the larger sense, it's a fundamental miracle of life. And it gives us a sense not just of what happens in, uh, with bread, but what happens with all of life and our sense of God's presence in all of it. So Jesus blesses it and breaks it. And when he breaks it, of course, he is reminding his uh, disciples of his own broken body and then of course uh, telling them this is this is this is my body uh, which is broken for you so he blesses it and he breaks it and he gives it to them that pattern is repeated at many places throughout the gospels and the feeding of the 5,000, uh, or, well, sometimes it's five, and sometimes it's four, and sometimes it's more. But in the feeding of the multitudes, it's always uh, the blessing, the breaking, uh, and the giving of the bread. And the idea that that bread is transformed, in one case, to feed the multitude, um, and in other cases, to remind us of Jesus' presence. So we have the disciples on their journey. And as Pastor Carroll talked about, 
They don't recognize him at first. Well, that tells us something about the resurrection appearances, that they are not simply the physical resuscitation of the earthly Jesus. This is something quite different in the way that he um, appears to them. So they're walking along, and they don't know who he is. And he's talking about the scriptures. And he's explaining that you have to see the scriptures through the eyes of, of Jesus. For Christians, that's, that's critical in terms of how we understand um, the Bible. We always see it through the eyes of Jesus. And then they get to Emmaus, and it's getting dark. And they say to him, hey, stay with us. Have a meal. Um, he says, no, no, I'm going to. And they say, no, no, really, stay. And then with a guest, as a point of um, honoring the guest, they ask him to say the blessing. And he does. And when he does, in that blessing and breaking and giving, they immediately recognize who he is. Well, that's, that's how we understand our um, communion, that in the blessing and the breaking and the sharing of the bread, Christ is present. There's been a lot of uh, debate um, on the internet and various um, chats among uh, Methodist clergy about whether or not it's appropriate to do online communion. And let me say that um, a few years back, the Methodist Church took the official position that you couldn't do online communion because um, it required the presence of the community. Now, I'm going to bring up Elaine again. When Elaine and I talked about that, and she said, why, would they, why wouldn't they let them do online communion? And I said, uh, well, it's about the, the presence of the community. And she said, um, credit where credit is due, she said, um, well, communion doesn't just grow out of communion, it, community, it creates community. Well, yeah, it does create community. And, 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 and taking that further, um, the argument against online communion is that it's supposed to be the real presence of, that we believe in the real presence of Christ in the sacrament. And if there is not a community present, and how is that real presence there? But that misses the point. Uh, that misses the point that um, it's not the sacrament that creates Christ's presence. It's Christ's presence that creates the sacrament, that, that makes it, in fact, a means of grace, uh, an experience of his presence, which is there um, whether we have communion physically together um, or apart. So I, I would invite you, especially as you share at home, uh, to recognize the presence of Christ with you, um, whether you sit by yourself um, or with others in a family group, whether your friends are uh, near or far, uh, that that community is real and that Christ's presence creates and strengthens that community. In communion, we remember Christ's presence among us, but we also, um, the, the word remember uh, in Hebrew means to bring the past into the present. And so what we do in our remembering is to bring that uh, into the presence, into the present as we share with one another. Let's be in a spirit of prayer. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the gift of Christ's presence with us now, with us forever. In Jesus' name.
as we remember how Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took the bread and blessed it as he always did. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech ha'olam hamotzi lecha unen ha'aretz. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And then he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is broken for you. And likewise, after the supper was over, Jesus took the cup, and after he had given thanks, he gave it to the disciples, and he said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink, in remembrance of me. And now Beth will play, and I invite you to share at home. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the gift of your presence in Christ, for our chance to share in communion, not only with one another, wherever we are, but with Christians all around the world. We ask that your presence, O oh Lord, in this gift of communion might help us to recognize you among the strangers, the friends, the neighbors, in this wonderful world you have given us. In Jesus' name, amen. This is the point in the service where if, uh, if you were here present, we would um, pause for our offering. So I want to take this time to say thank you uh, to all the folks who have been so supportive, uh, sending your gifts by mail or online. Um, this is a time when you might do that if you, if you have not already, but we give you thanks for uh, all the ways in which you have been supportive. As I'm staring at the at the camera, I'm going to take a minute and turn my head and say, "Yes, the sun is sort of shining outside." Normally, normally I'm looking toward the back of the church, and so I recognize that. Now, after several weeks of doing uh, worship this way, I, I, I feel like I'm going to end up, when we're finally back together, if in fact we are before I retire, uh, when we're finally back together, I feel like I'm going to start, I'm going to give sermons preaching to the wall. I'm going to be turned <laughs> sideways, and people are going to go like, what's Bill looking at? I'm looking at the camera, for heaven's sakes, right? Isn't there a camera there? I'm glad you could join us uh, again. We wish it could be in person, but we're glad to be joined um, across the miles. It's wonderful that we are able to connect with people from uh, really all around the country um, in a time of uh, worship and reflection. So I send you forth with good news that God loves you and accepts you just the way that you are. And by that love and acceptance calls to you and to me to accept this day and this life as God's gift, to live it to the full, to share God's love and hope and joy with one another.
Amen.